Ooh. Hello. Oh, hello, hello. People in chat already. Welcome, everyone. Today, we've got another exciting stream for you, as always. We, yep. we wouldn't stream if it wasn't exciting. Yeah, we always keep it exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we'll do the typical top of the show stuff, but we'll, we're going to be going into the new UI, um, a whole ton of features, and basically just give you um, a bit of a development update. Uh, some of our you know, beta programs have started. We've got people signed up. Um, last week we mentioned we're testing out a bunch of printers, so we'll be talking about that too. Um, mainly focusing on this new UI, which is out now. Um, and then we'll also be talking, you know, a bit about the future and that kind of stuff. So yeah. if you have any questions, um, make sure to sign into YouTube and, you know, join the chat. We're reading chat. We already see you. Hudson, uh, Digital Rain, Bob, of course, first one in today. And, and Kevin joining us as always. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions. We'll be watching chat. Um, it'll be a bit easier to respond to chat as well since it's just us today. And speaking of uh, just us, I'm Mateo Package. I'm one of the co-founders of 3DQ and, and today I'm joined by Steven. Yep, I'm the product lead at 3DQ for Quinlink. So two, uh, Pretty relevant guys to be giving a dev update. Today. Yeah, we do a bit of stuff here. Mateo does most of the uh, software side of things. I'm more on the hardware side. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the stream is mainly focused on on the software. Um, so I'll be picking your brain a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Trying to figure out what we've been doing these last couple of months. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, is there so, anything else that we should get, get out of the way right at the beginning? Yeah, maybe, um, I guess no. we could just give a quick little update on beta testing, sure. just, just so people know. Um, so if you've, if you've been on the, the email list, um, you'll know that beta is fully underway, and we're actually, um, we have a sign-up form on our website. If you want a beta test for the CR6 SE, the CR10, or the Sidewinder, um, X1 or X2, those are both um, fully underway at this point, but you can still join. Um, so the plan is we should be shipping kits mid-November if all goes well. Um, so that's just kind of a timeline. Um, so if you sign up before then, all should be good. Yeah, and you can get to that page just on our site. If you go to the shop, there's a category called beta testing, or you might get this pop-up. Um, and so you can you can sign up in here or you can sign up here, you'll get a welcome, like a welcome email. And from there we can, you can tell us what printers you have. And, and if we're currently working on any betas, um, you know, you'll be invited to join. And if there's a printer you'd really like to have automation developed for, and you know, a whole bunch of other people who want that as well. Um, I definitely encourage them to all sign up and email us because, you know, if, if there's enough interest for a particular model, we'll definitely prioritize that one. Yeah, and we're actually looking for that feedback like right now because we're gonna we're trying to plan a decent bit into the future right now. So mm -hmm. yeah, get your opinion heard. Um, yeah, that's it for beta. Um, we're gonna be moving on to the software for the main part of the stream. Um, so maybe we should just give a little bit of an outline on sort of what we're gonna go over, sort of as the main topics. So we've been recently talking about um, various betas going on with the software. We're actually pretty close to releasing the full production-ready release for you guys. Um, so Mateo, so Mateo, <laughs> um, yeah, what are we going to be going over this stream? What's kind of the structure? So the big, uh, the 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 biggest, you know, most easy to see thing is is obviously we've completely done redone our UI and we showed this off in the summer and now it's actually done. And, um, with the help of, you know, 20 really, really engaged, um, testers, we've over the last month or so, we've been doing a whole bunch of beta testing. So we were initially planning to release it as Quinley 1.0.0, 0, 0, 
but it's actually now Quinley 1.0.4 is what you'll be getting because there's been so many, um, like so much feedback and, and so many feature adjustments and feature fi uh, fixes. So it's, it's as if you're getting kind of five updates in one big update. So we'll be going through um, the UI, actually showing you like it running printers and how we've worked with the community to build features that help them use their printers more effectively. So that's gonna be a big theme. Um, we'll be going through the different screens. We'll be talking about what's been added, how it works and why it works that way. And then we'll also be talking about like um, how these features came from you know real use cases. So a, a lot of our beta testers are people who run Etsy stores, for example. So there's some features that help them organize their production for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's definitely a massive update. Um, if anyone wants to get their hands early on it, to uh, on it like super early, uh, you can always message me on Discord. But it's actually going to be going up uh, tonight. So, <laughs> how early do you really yeah, get it? <laughs> yeah, it's like by the time I get home, it'll be available. And if you are a Quinley user already, this update is uh, totally free, um, and you can download it in the 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 normal link for downloading our software on the resources page um but yeah i'm really excited because this is like the culmination of a massive amount of work um on our dev team and also from our, our community like it's it's pretty insane we're pretty lucky to have so many um, people who are willing to get builds and, and try them out and help us um so should we just kind of go right in and and show the new ui and yeah i guess yeah why why wait why wait yeah i guess why wait it's a good question um all right so we've got it on two printers here so i'm just gonna we're just gonna walk through the ender one first so something we've been working really hard to do since the beginning and also um oh there's a bunch of comments but something we've been working um pretty hard to do since the beginning is making it so that when you load quinley and connect it to your printer you have to do no configuration so um, i think this is kind of a not immediately noticeable to to anyone using quinley but you can switch between the supported printers um and it will automatically reconfigure itself. So you're, you're not spending, you know, time finding the best settings or anything. You're not, you're not spending time like meticulously configuring Quinly to function with your machine. It, it'll just support it out of the, like out of the box. So if you have an Ender 3, um, it'll detect that it's on an Ender 3 and it'll configure itself to work with an Ender 3 and you won't have to go through any complicated menus or anything. So um, yeah, like you, you don't really have to do anything in the command line. You don't need to know how to do coding. It's just you write an SD card, you plug it in, and it basically just works. And plug it in. <laughs> yeah, plug um, it into the printer. It's as pain free as you can make a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, which is which is, and this has been a really big focus of ours because a lot of people who are using three D printing for production don't want to frig around with the software. So we've been gathering feedback as, as much as we can to, to make it a very streamlined process. So it is really, you just plug the Pi in and, um, and you can go, there's no, you don't have to change any settings, for example. Um, so here's the main page. Um, this is kind of your overview screen. Funnily enough, uh, this is probably one of the pages you're gonna be looking at the least, um, mainly because this is just like a, an overview for what your printer is currently doing right now. It doesn't, it's it's like for when you wanna get into the nitty gritty, um, there is a live feed though, um, but it's more like if you, know, if you want to manually send G code commands or do some settings or s get more detail about what your printer is doing. It's kind of at a glance, like what's going on with this printer. Um, 
you'll see on the right there's you can queue up jobs and and it'll also show you what jobs were finished on that printer and this we'll talk through that as well um but yeah it's basically everything you need to know for one of your production machines uh, at a glance uh, it's got the same suspend and abort functions it's yeah oh show that you can it tells you what the uh buttons actually do now <laughs> oh yeah yeah so this is a piece of feedback but a lot of people were confused at the difference between suspend and abort and the reason we introduced suspend it's an kind of an automation only functionality so a lot of people didn't understand what it was for i use suspend today oh really yeah <laughs> nice yeah you might be the first person to ever use it <laughs> but we added little tool tips and we're going to be over time adding tool tips uh to as many places as we can where we see people getting confused or stuck but suspend was like one of the most confusing features um that was not immediately obvious so we, mm -hmm. we added this um so you'll see there's actually tons of like quality of life improvements yeah. in this thing as well. So um, I think if you're first seeing the Quinley software, um, it's going to be a lot more intuitive to figure out some of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's the whole point. It should be easy to use. It's, it, it's your, your printer is a tool. It's not like, I mean, unless you're, you know, totally in love with messing around with your printer. Uh, but there's other software for that. Like this is just a production tool. Yeah, actually, see if you can send a G28, see the live feed. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there are like more powerful tools, like if you want to manually send G code. Um, but yeah, you can see now the printer is homing. It's a bit laggy probably because of our internet, but we've also actually spent time uh, reducing the overhead on the whole system and I'll talk a bit about why we did that later but it also comes from a community request um, so that's kind of the quality of life I need it mm -hmm. Kevin says um, yeah let's show this so this is like cool but my favorite page is actually the files page that we've introduced so this page um, is a repository where you can keep you know all of your production files and organize them and I, I think it's very important that this system is actually you know close to the production because we started uh, you know we we, we ran a, a 50 printer print farm and we had been relying on things like google drive um, for file management and sharing and recently we started using grabcat as well and having um you know having an external system for storing files is actually really really cumbersome and none of those systems are really built for 3d printer file management mm -hmm. and and they aren't being built that way so um what we decided was to implement you know a, a place we can store our production ready g codes on the quinley itself so that we don't have to worry about losing track of files um so it's got you know all your kind of basic features um you can obviously upload files uh one quality of life thing we added is you can upload multiple files because we realize when we're doing production runs like for example all these ultimaker files that you have here steven um like with with printer automation you have the ability to send many files at once mm -hmm. and so we had to add the ability to upload many files at once believe it or not like yeah because if i wanted to make a queue of parts so these are actual parts we use in production if i wanted to send all nine of these parts for example i would have to actually go in you know, like one by one upload which isn't great when you're normally 3d printing that's how you always do it you just go one by one yeah. but in this case you want to do a ton at a time yeah, so we, we basically introduced across the whole system, like the ability to bulk order parts, bulk queue, change settings in bulk. And this is something a lot of people don't realize, like why it's so difficult to uh, develop. Can they actually see that window? Oh, they might not be. Able Probably to. won't be able to show that. That's true. Anyway, the window was like a file browser where I just selected a whole bunch of files. Um, you can show them 
yeah. deleting a bunch of files at the same time. You can too. delete a bunch of files. <laughs> sure, let's do seven, um, eight, nine. But the whole system is built built for like bulk processing of parts, so you can now select multiple files and you know delete them all at once. And then if you upload them, you can. What did I delete? Seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. You can upload them all at once as well. Um, so that's like. You can see they'll start populating down here. Uh, so that that's kind of key to a lot of the workflow because when we had started and modeled it off of things like other hosts like Octoprint or whatever, you kind of have to do everything one at a time. And um, we realized like that doesn't work at all for automation. So now the really cool part is, you know, if you want to, because you have an infinite queue, if you want to just send a whole ton of print jobs, that's really easy as well. So you can just, if I wanted like, let's say I wanted to make one Ultimaker kit, right? I would select every single um, Ultimaker part here and then hit add to queue. We're actually probably going to be doing about oh, like a week of printing in this two minutes. Yeah, in, in two minutes, you can set up a whole week's worth of printing. And so try setting like a quantity of like 10 for each one. Yeah. Exactly. And it'll do it. Okay, let's do 10. But the, I mean, the cool thing is you don't have to do 10 of each one. You could do or just one of each different amounts. Maybe we want two of this one. Yeah. And three of this one. Yeah. Cause that's a five times. Yeah. Cause some of them you need to print multiple times. Yeah. Some of them you don't. Um, so you can, yeah, basically <laughs> like this is now, you know, probably 150 hours worth of printing that you're scheduling in the span of a couple minutes. And I think that's, really cool and it's going to be really exciting um for a lot of people because <laughs> it's like stuff that we need and and stuff that we've gotten a ton of you know requests for so, so this is saving you like 50 times that you have to go to your printer restart the print scrape the bed yeah. that's all getting taken care of right here right now even even if you're like oh well it only takes me like you know five minutes to set up a print that's still saving you 250 hours or 250 minutes which is six hours of, of time just by having the infinite queue and, and having this kind of interface the other thing that we've added that a lot of people have probably noticed like a lot of uh, can you print an entire folder just by selecting it i'll show you how to do that but yes you can um the other thing that we've got here is um being able to modify the release temp. So you can actually modify it per part, but you can also modify it for the entire batch of parts. So like, let's say I was printing these in ABS. Um, up until now, the default release temp on Quinley was set to 29 degrees C because that's safest. We know it works with pretty much all filaments, but we also know that for materials like ABS or polycarbonate, you can get away with a release temp that's like 40 or 50 degrees C. Mm -hmm. So if you want to send a batch and you've got ABS loaded in your Ender 3, um, you know, I can just set it to 40 here and s just send all of these to print. Now I know <laughs> these are in PLA, so I'm going to set it back to 29, but um, it's just like another level of control you get. You can even do a the reason you can do it per part is that some parts can be released at higher temperatures. Um, so if you're like really into optimizing, you know, every last minute out of your production, you could be like, oh, well, this one, you know, I can release it at 32 and that'll save me five minutes per cycle. Yeah. And so it's like, like really small parts with a small footprint, you can get away with a higher temperature. Yeah. So I'm going to send these off to the queue get the big green check mark and I'm going to view the queue. And so now this is just, um, shows you what you've got scheduled. Again, you can multi select, delete multiple, or you can just delete individual. Um, it's basically just here to make, you know, make your life easier. You can easily keep track of, you know, what, what's coming up when it was sent. Um, how much of whatever is printing. 
And you'll notice here on the right, so the reason I was saying this screen you're probably not going to spend too much time on is because the queue actually gives you a quick preview of your printer on the right. And so you can see exactly what your printer is doing here. Right now it's heating. There's a progress bar that will start filling up once it starts printing. Um, and, you know, it'll tell you what's printing, how many are left. Uh, and and some other basic information. And then if you want more information, you can just go to the overview. Um, you can see the bed temperature going up right now. It's starting to heat for the print job. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Uh, yeah, but I'll go back to the files page because that's cool. That's like, there's actually still a couple more features on there I think would be good to talk about, like the download. There's folders too. Oh, someone is speaking in Cyrillic. I can't. I don't know how to read Cyrillic. I can't either. That wonder. Nice, apparently. Oh wow, she's replying in the same language. I wonder what it means. <laughs> we'll never know. Okay. Um. Yeah, actually, that release temperature thing was our one of our big most requested things. Um, yeah, it was requested a ton, especially over the summer where some people had a hard time getting down to 29 because it was so hot yeah now you can easily change it to like 30 31 mm -hmm. makes it a lot quicker um yeah but actually going back to the files page the other thing that you've got here that we didn't really talk about was you can set you can organize your files in different ways and now this this is like where production and and we're going to be building on this in the future but this is where it really comes in handy for production because you probably don't just want a giant list of G-code files. And I know that everyone's download folder <laughs> that's watching this stream is like a massive mix of random G-codes that they've downloaded. calling everyone out right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mine is too, so <laughs> I know. But like, that was one of the problems that would happen when using external services like Google Drive because what would happen, um, you know, whether you were using Quinly or Octoprint or, or, you know, even Repetier Host is you'd have a shared drive for all of the users of your farm. And then each user would have to download the G code to their computer and then upload it to um, Octoprint or whatever, or Quinly. And what we noticed happened a lot was you would, like we would start downloading files and then someone might make an update, but not everyone knows to download the most up-to-date file because it doesn't really tell you. Um, and so you might send an out-of-date G-code file into production and then it's living there on production and you could accidentally, you know, print the wrong G-code. Yeah. And th I, this has happened before, like, and not just to us, but it just becomes very difficult to keep track of. Whereas here, and maybe Stephen, you want to show, but anyone, um, you know, here it's set for like a local network. So anyone that has got access to the network of printers can actually upload files to the built-in drive so that you can kind of ensure that only the latest G code is present to be sent to, um, to the printer. And Steven's going to demonstrate. He's on his laptop here on the left, and he's going to upload a file, and then we'll see it. Uh, we'll see it pop up uh, while he does that. I'm going to answer some questions. Kevin, you already have access to it. You're in the <laughs> in the beta uh, in the beta folder. Um. What should I upload? I'm going to do anything that's not in there already. Yeah, I'm going to do Octopus. Octopus. Octopus 4. Okay, so Steven's got his laptop open. And he's just sent Octopus 4. Yeah. Okay, I just saw all files change to 14. Here it is. So now, you know, it's kind of like a simplified uh, version of Google Drive where you can just, anyone can upload into here and you can make sure that you have, you know, the best G code available. If, for example, I have, 
you know, a new version of Octopus, Octopus 5, and I want to make sure no one else is going to print Octopus 4 because, you know, it goes, you know, over extrudes or whatever. I can delete it from here um, so that no one else can, can print it and replace it with my latest file. Or I can just overwrite this file and then everyone will have the latest one. Um, if I want to back up something before deleting it, we've also added the download functionality. So you click that and, uh, oh yeah, you guys should see they, it. They do see it, I checked it. Yeah, <laughs> so you'll see it gets downloaded. And you can also bulk download things as well. So if you hit download, it'll just rapid fire start downloading things. Just be careful. Our network is a little bit slow because of the stream right now. Uh, and I picked a really big file to download. The, uh, another print. Oh yeah, here. Sounded like it was starting. They're here. They're here in the in the downloads. So yeah, you can bulk download. You can do backups and then delete stuff too. Here we go. Yeah. Have you shown the folders yet? I'm showing the folders now. Yeah. So the other cool thing we added was folders for organization, and so you have kind of all files here, but you can also set up folders. Um, so, for example, in Quinley Parts, we've got these Ultimaker pieces. Um, but I'm noticing, you know, not all of them are in there. So what you can do is move parts into your folder. So let's see, what do we have here? Two, three, four. I'm going to add one, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hit move to. Hit Quinley Parts. And then that should move it over into the new folder. So you can see in Quinley Parts, we now have all of the Ultimaker folders. And if you have any files that you know belong in multiple places at once, um, which we sometimes do with the Quinleys, we have common parts that live between kits. You can also make, um, and, and this is pretty interesting, you can make like a, a, a an instance of it in each folder. So let's say, you know, this is actually Quinley Ultimaker parts. Um, and then if I have Quinley Trusha parts, and I don't know, maybe U, one, two, and three can also be used for the Prusha. What I can do is hit move to, Quinley Prusha, and then keep the files in the original folder, and then hit copy. And now, you know, now I'll have those three files in here as well. Uh, then of course, if you have files in multiple folders, want to remove it from one folder, you can just hit remove too, it's pretty easy. And that's actually, Kevin, that's how you select all the file, files in a folder. Yeah, so if you actually want to send everything in a folder to print, you hit this. You Well, you click on your folder, and then you hit this, and then just hit Add to Queue. And now everything in your folder will be in here, and you can just send that off to the queue. And it's like, it's as simple as that, really. Now you can see, like, we've got an insane amount of things living in the queue. Oh, I see the Quinley... For Ender's printing. We're part way through a print. Oh, yeah, it's so doing stuff. It Look at that. <laughs> and you'll notice the live stream um, is actually quite a lot smoother now than in the betas for anyone participating that was participating in the betas. We spent a lot of time reducing the overhead of the whole system um, so that, you know, so that you can have a better live stream. But the ulterior motive is so that we can work towards supporting different devices other than the Raspberry Pi or supporting lower powered Raspberry Pis or um, even supporting multiple instances of Quinley on a single Pi, uh, which is again, like one of those super highly requested features. Um, let's check if there are any questions. Anon. <laughs> We would if there were not legal restrictions in place. Um, very nice of us to give them the lease terms. Thanks, Kevin. We've been working hard on it. 
Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for, for testing for us too, Kevin. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that those are kind of the main features. And you can see how, um, you know, over the months when we've been speaking to store owners, production houses, universities, you can see how a lot of these features build into their types of use cases. So, um, for example, at a university, you know, you would want to have some, maybe each student uh, project having a separate folder in here and so that you don't end up with a whole bunch of files mixed into one another. Or actually what you'll see a lot at universities is um, you know, a whole bunch of random files on an SD card. And then mm. you have to, like, it's really difficult to find your files. You have to scroll through everything. So um, the folders are just a nice way of organizing things. Um, Steven demonstrated, you know, as a team, everyone can upload into this drive. And so you can have personal, you can set up like personal folders for yourself and your team, or you can set up, um, like project folders, for example. So anytime you're printing for a project that needs more than one type of part, these folders come in super handy because you can just, you know, select it and send it to the queue and you'll get like one complete thing of your project done and, and printed. Yeah. So like imagine that that is all the parts needed for a project or it's basically an assembly thing. Mm -hmm. You could get all those parts with just a few clicks. Um, and they'll eventually print one at a time without you having to touch a printer. It's really cool. Do we have a video of the Ultimaker that I can show them, like how many different printed pieces there are? Um, there's something on the there's some stuff on the drive I can send you. Yeah, I'll send it to me. I guess it would probably be interesting to show, like a real world use case. In our case, like our Quinley kits have between, uh, you know, uh, thirteen and twenty four parts. And just being able to order up an entire kit at once like this by hitting, you know, selecting all and sending it to the queue. I don't have to worry about really keeping specific inventory or like keeping track of what I've sent into production as closely anymore because I can send the whole kit at once. Um, I see Steven just sending me. I guess this is to me. <laughs> Are you sending it on Discord? Yeah, I'll just send it through Discord. Okay. Then, uh, where should I send it? I'll send it in. Just send it to me on Discord. Yeah, okay. So, like you can see, there's lots of 3D printed parts, but. There's actually 25, 25 unique parts that go into this kit. And you can just, you know, one or how many clicks is it? It's, let's see, one, two, three, three clicks to print 25 parts to get an entire kit. Done. Like imagine how simple, that, how nice that would be for some of those like crazy intricate projects that require a whole ton of pieces like i'm imagining uh you know sending like one of those clocks that you can 3d print you yeah. just send it all in one click and come back a little while later you could do like a chess set oh that'd be super easy in one one click um the other thing that we've added so there's like a lot of this is all stuff that you see there's some quality of life stuff too where you can name each printer uh, so you can see this one's called Office Ender 3. And if you have multiple Quinleys, um, the names actually show up in the tabs in your browser. So here's the the Prusa. And you can see like up top here, it's kind of small, but you'll be able to just select through your printer very easily. And this is like, this is something that we added um, because right now the way we were keeping track of printers like where they are physically was by their IP address, which can change sometimes. 
kind of weird. Yeah, <laughs> and you'd have to like click through every tab until you found the printer you want. Yeah. So now, um, now you don't have to do that anymore. Now you can give each one a name, and it'll show up in the tab, and you can just navigate through all your printers. Um, so you don't have to be naming your printers like seventy four. Yeah. Anymore, it's uh, you can call them like frog, octopus. You can give them animal names, or you could just do normal stuff like Prusa. Did you say octopus? Octopus. Yeah. You can give them the animal names. You see that it updated up top. Here it's updated. <laughs> and so one thing that we are trying to do is create a very uniform experience, no matter what printer uh, is connected. So your interface and your interactions are all going to be very, very similar, no matter which printer is showing up. And the reason for that is, um, if you can imagine, the, the whole point of Quinley is to manage your printers for you, make it more simple, and also lower the skill barrier required to use 3D printers. So in, in something like a university setting, you don't want students to be all get confused about you know you have five different types of 3d printers you don't want them getting confused like which settings do i need to enable for what printers uh quinley does that for you and when we are looking at pro and and networking the printers together into a single queue quinley is able to distinguish between one another's and, and even like assign jobs on the compatible printer so if you're printing something really big uh you might quinley would only send it to something like a cr10 versus the prusa mk3s um so it, it'll make those kinds of decisions which are very simple decisions but decisions nonetheless it'll do that for you so that you're you know not wasting time and brain power trying to figure out how to distribute jobs across your print network so that's one of the um, one of the big things we're working towards uh, with the the farm oriented versions of this software. Just to, also to make it clear, setting it up for a Prusa is just as easy as setting it up for an Ender or CR10 or CR6 now. It's, a, it's identical. They're and all. It's just plug and play. Put the SD card in, connect to Wi-Fi, and Quinly is available for you. Go to an IP address. So should we talk about, so we've kind of gone through, this is most on the surface level, this is most of what the UI uh, changes are. You'll find like a lot of really small things that we've considered about how things should work. Um, I guess I could even talk through the process of designing a feature because it is, when you think about automating printers and scaling 3D printers, even really mundane features like, um, you know, like changing the flow rate in the machine has a lot of impact. Um, like if you want to change a setting, like setting the flow rate, you have to consider, like it, there's a lot of extra dimensionality. Um, when you're printing on a normal machine and you want to increase your flow rate, you just increase your flow rate and then that's it. But when you're printing on an automated system, especially when you have multiple 3D printers, you have to consider, am I increasing the flow rate for this particular part? Is it for this particular printer? Or is it for this particular print job? And then you have to think about things like, if I have a farm of five printers and I change the flow rate on one printer, every part that goes to that one printer is going to be different. Is that what the user wants? Like, mm -hmm. do they want inconsistent parts off this one printer? Maybe they do. Maybe they're compensating for something on the on the printer itself, you know, a different extruder or a different nozzle. Or is it something that I need to compensate for in the print job? And, you know, as a job can go onto any printer in my network, do I have to modify the flow rate for whatever printer that that job hits and then change it back once that printer picks up a different job right so it's important to know the kind of scope yeah of whatever feature you're developing yeah it's and it and in an automated like distributed production system even like tiny mundane things like that 
there's so many more cases you have to consider because it's automated and you don't have an operator that's there, you know, ready to fix anything mm -hmm. uh, as soon as it goes wrong. You have to present all that information up front and in an intuitive way. And you also have to consider all the, like the vast um, variations and, and, and set of edge cases that you're now presented with because you're thinking of the farm as a single thing now rather than a bunch of individual printers that you're attending to so yeah like that's why it sometimes takes you a lot, a lot of people ask like oh why are there no you know basic features like um flow rate right it's there's a lot of thinking and design that has to happen for flow rate to work on a, a farm system yeah like it really has to be like does this feature make sense to add or would it be better for us to compensate for it in a different way or give people the option but then like what are the options like mm -hmm. <laughs> if you if because if you if you make a mistake and if you set your flow rate on one printer um then every and you send one uh the same part to be printed on your whole farm those parts are going to come off different on that one printer. You're going to have one that's extruded normally and the rest that are under extruded. Or yeah, exactly. Maybe that's what you wanted, so it's hard to yeah, know. Yeah, so do you, do you want that? In which case, we'll give you the option to do that. Or do you want it to update uh, the flow rate no matter what printer it gets assigned to? And mm -hmm. like you'll get the option to do that. But you can see how so many things have to be considered and fall out of out of just this single setting um, when you're when you're automating farm management so, so right now it's a lot of this is built into g code so if you want to improve your prints we're thinking this is how you're going to do it for production you want to be editing the g code and optimizing the g code in your slicer rather than on the fly because when you optimize the g code in the slicer then that carries across from every print from every printer Whereas if you're doing it on the fly, it's hard to know if you want it for just one print or multiple. Oh, there's so we got a new people. A bunch of stuff to catch up on. Yeah. So yeah, you, you like all of this that we're showing is is available for it it comes with the Quinley kit. Um so all of this functionality comes with the, the Quinley kit. So you can open up, you know, multiple printers and manage and have them infinite queue. Um Yeah, so every Quinley kit Everyone who's ha who has a Quinley and everyone who buys a Quinley will get this software um, included with the kit. There's no yeah. subscription. There's no additional charges. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the stuff that, that will have additional charges down the road has more to do with, uh, you know, professional use and like a lot more. I mean, this can be used extremely effectively for professional use, not, not to say that it can't, but it, it's for, you know, managing fleets of printers, um, environments where you expect to have many users and you need to, you know, permission them certain ways. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. different from someone who just needs a tool to manage their printer 24 seven. And, and even that tool is, you know, highly valuable and it, it's pretty easy to just you know, connect up a bunch of printers to Quinley and flip through them like this. Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to be using, you know, remote cloud storage, but, and this is something I'll talk to at the end, but there are going to be options for even like remote access and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's all kind of hosted locally. You're not, you're not uh, doing any sort of fancy server stuff for this um so let's see what other comments it's only free for managing one printer at a time okay yeah we that's what we just talked through pat says temperature offset is something i use a lot if you're taking feature requests temperature offset i think Could that's when you adjust the temperature on the fly oh you can do that already or do you mean per job Actually, Pat, if you could explain what exactly you mean by temperature offset, um, that would be awesome. Because are you saying that different printers in your farm 
all have different like thermistor offsets that need to be set or is it just more like um you know a temperature offset for a print job for example that you've already sliced i can see maybe having um i know some beds don't actually get to the temperature that they report yeah so like if you mount a vapor on top of glass then it'll actually be like five degrees lower than whatever you set it to um but you would just slice at 65. yeah well you could do that but then i guess if you have a I guess this is when you have multiple different printers connected up right. in a central. That's um, a good queue. Point. Then you would then you might want a separate offset for every. Oh, printer. for different filaments. Oh, that's cool. This is actually okay. Got it. So printer one has Prusa filament. It prints at two fifteen, two oh five, and and you're printing from the same G code file, right? Um. Well, we are actually looking at yeah. We at were that too. We were adding that back when we were working on our farm management software, we had different material profiles that would affect some, like what printers it gets sent to in the first place. And uh, we, were lo we were working on adding things like flow rates for material and temperature offsets for material. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something we Got might it. be actually looking at as a material library. That's for, yeah, so that, that kind of thing, that material management across a print farm is what you can expect to see in, in more of the pro features, pro versions of the software, where it's like, you would actually have, and what, what we built was, you'd have a library of materials um, that you can assign to any printer in your farm. And then with the central queue, it would like, you would pick a file, tell it, I'm printing it in blue PLA, and then it would only match it to blue PLA printers. And we were adding also, before we started working on Quinley, we were just at the point where you could add things like temperature offsets into those material profiles so that then they would be applied to your G code. Um, so it is actually, you know, once we get pro and networking uh, out as part of Quinley and, and not just our internal software, um, that's like a super realistic thing to expect to be able to do. Yeah. Um, it helps a ton with, with farm management uh, for sure. Like I know we were using it a lot. I guess maybe some of these guys don't know, but we were initially developing this software to be used as farm software. And then we switched to making it single user software. So like Quinley for one printer, just to make it available to everyone. Um, but a lot of the, the sort of planning and design has already been done for turning it into a farm software. Um, and that's what we actually used during COVID for our farm of like 40 or more printers. Yeah, between 40, 40 had, and 50. We had different levels of printers that were yeah, online. Because some of them would get pulled out for R&D at different yeah. times. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was that was actually a, a functionality we, we have built um for the farm management parts of it kevin's asking would be that be like asking users for any filament settings they've used on what printers not exactly but that will build into uh you know asking users to share filament settings so that if there could be something like a global material library where if someone else is using you know hatchbox black pla and you start typing in Hatchbox Black PLA, it might pre-populate it if, if someone else had already, uh, you know, volunteered their settings for that filament. Um, yeah, machine creator sync says, I think more like spool bearings. That's, that's, how, that's how we had it set up initially, but Kevin's uh, thinking a bit, bit into the pro, uh, into the future of like, the benefits of having things, you know, networked and, and sharing information, uh, you know, sharing like best settings between users. Right now we have a Google form that anyone has access to uh, and a spreadsheet where we're just collecting all the different filaments that people have used. Um, and we have some internal records too, but eventually that kind of thing is going to be built in to Quinley. Um, and and so that it just helps with the ease of printing uh, like the, the experience or making the experience much easier for you because um, you can imagine like you just got a brand new prusa 
you have no idea what uh, the temperature offsets for the bed and the hot end should be. But someone else who owns Quinlay for Prusa might have been like, hey, um, you know, I print PLA, I print Polymaker Black PLA at 225 and 67 and so if if they've reported that we might be able to just like in, when when you're typing your material in pre-populated quinley we'll see oh you've got a prusa 2 you know prusa mk3 as well and you're using the same filament that someone else had submitted settings for and we'll just pre-populate that for you and, and you can adjust from there Hey Thornhill, nice, nice to, to see you. you. Um, any ETA on the Pro version? I use Octoform now. I dread losing it with the switch to machines to work with what you have. So we're we're rolling out Pro. Um, we're working on. We're mostly focused right now on Pro in terms of like remote networking and accessibility from anywhere. Um, so we're planning to do that over the next couple months. I think. We're saying quarter one, 2022 is sort of when it'll be, when it'll be ready. Um, but we're looking at opening betas for Pro very, very soon. Once the Ultimaker beta has kind of come and gone, um, it'll, it'll pretty much the focus will be on Pro. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Pat, what are the, um, what are some of the key features of Octofarm that you don't want to lose? Oh, Steph already asked you that. File manager. So file manager. Oh, interesting. That's, we have this too. So we don't have to program that. The temperature offset saves filament profiles. Oh, okay. Yeah, Pat, that this is, is working. that's actually all stuff that's we were using this before. Yeah, that's that <laughs> we developed like last the spring of twenty nineteen. So this is all stuff that we were using internally. So if if those are the features that you're dreading losing, that's yeah, you'll you'll get those back very soon. Like we uh, I wonder if I can show him a screen, can yeah, can you find a screenshot of our farm UI? The old one or the, yeah, the old one, one from Monos? No, no, the old one. The uh, real one. Uh, it would be in Google Drive. We'll show you a screenshot of, of what we had before, before the Quinley redesign. I think I can find it. Uh, okay, yeah, all of this stuff, Pat, is actually was completed before a pivot to Quinley last summer is this guy yeah there it is although that's a mock-up that's not the real one. Oh, i don't know if i can find it on the drive okay it's I'll just it's pretty representative of okay it. sure yeah it is here not the highest quality image but I'll, I'll just google it oh that works too so this is this is just we had to we're pulling this up very quickly but i'll give you a sense of um what the farm software we started developing initially at 3dq it was actually it wasn't even called quinley at the time um i'll give you a sense of what it looks like it's a q suite we were printing it on qpod yeah <laughs> which was our bank of uh nine by nine bank of printers search up uh 3dq yeah out here this is kind of what it looks like wish there was a better quality though yeah i couldn't find one but this is this is so this is what our old uh ui before the redesign the internal ui we had looked like this so you could have a central queue of all jobs you could auto assign it to different printers um and then you would have all the different 3D printer statuses. And you could see they were sorted by status. This was designed by me, and I'm by no means a UX designer. <laughs> so 
we're looking to, you know, rejig things quite a bit um, when we bring it into into Quinly for for everyone to use, like as an actual product. Here, um, I'm, gonna say, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you actually a video of sending a job in G Suite. Okay, you've got a video. That's yeah. awesome. Quick searching. <laughs> okay. Uh. Please bear with us. This is uh. I'm gonna see if we have any uh. A little bit on the fly here. Anyone in chat? Okay. Yeah. Here. Oh look, there's an old picture of the team too. <laughs> so. So. So th this this is so this is our our farm UI like this is this is what we started with before we started creating Quinly. So you could select your material and color, and then it would get queued up. Oh, that's very quick. I'm gonna grab the frame at the end. Uh, let me make it slow. It's gonna be faster. What? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, those um <laughs> it is really quick. That was a massive queue. Look at that. One of two thirty. So Yeah, so this was the unorganized drive that we used to have before we added folders. Um but you would select the G code, you'd select a material and you'd just say how many you wanted. So pretty simple. And then you could configure the materials to some extent. Um uh, we, you know, offsets are very, very easy to add. And then it would just throw it into the queue. And you can see now this doesn't show the farm overview, but you can see in the queue overview, you would see exactly what printer it got sent to and, um, you know, how many quantities there are, what printers it's assigned to, but not printing on yet as well. So this was already, this has been built you know, over a year ago now. Um, and it's just a matter of bringing it into Quinly. Um, and, you know, deploying it on site, which is what we used to do with our software, um, we would require our clients to have uh, a server that, like a computer on site that was controlling everything. And for something like Quinly, that's made to be a self install process. It was much too complicated. We'd have to send installers to our clients to do it. So what we did last year after COVID, obviously no one can travel to send uh, installers anywhere. Um, we started taking our software and, um, you know, wrapping it into something that, that was much more user-friendly, uh, which, which came out as Quinly. And... Um, so now we're kind of in the process of bringing all of that farm functionality back into Quinly, actually making it, you know, self install again. And yeah. the main thing we're working on now for pro is um, the like networking aspect of it. So we figured out a way to deploy it where you don't need a central control uh, system and you'd be able to access it from anywhere on the internet obviously to be password protected and stuff but you can you'd be able to access it remotely um and you wouldn't need anything other than uh, microcontrollers for the printer so it's it's much more hardware friendly to the user and, and that's you know that takes a lot of work to do um there's a good question about um from pat just the uh startup power draw when a printer's bed that's, is heating. <laughs> that's so funny. Like this is literally all stuff that when we had our our you know 40 50 printer farm, these are all things that we were working on and had designed and built into the software. So there is a way to prevent too many printers from being in the heating state at one time because that's exactly what would happen. If you just sent jobs to every single printer, it would pull way too much power and trip trip the breaker yeah we did so, it a few times yeah yeah so there's <laughs> literally like stuff stuff that's designed for that in in the uh in the internal software that we're just now repackaging for everyone to use yeah so i guess it's good so that we're we're, we're not developing all this stuff from scratch 
yeah it's actually a lot of it, of it's there we're just kind of working it to fit with what we've already built for for the single use quinley um calvin asks do you think it, you could build a 200 print farm that produces consistently i have a sales for such setups um a 200 print mm -hmm. farm yeah i mean a lot of people like there it's not uncommon to have 200 printer print farms a lot of universities do um getting them to print consistently we think is a matter of having the right software right now printing relies too heavily on operators and every single operator because they are humans have their own quirks and their own way of doing things and one thing that we really quickly came to realize with automation is because it's a very consistent process all of your printers get treated consistently and your farm stays far more calibrated than if you have human operators that's not even taking into account things like with other print surfaces you're either removing the surface or scraping the surface and applying force to the printer whereas with ours um, because it's auto release there, there's no force applied to the actual printer body or frame so printers will stay in calibration far far longer and the software also has things built in that help um, you know that that look at the g code that process the g code to help it print better um, you know when a job is sent like it will remove certain problematic uh, things that might interfere with the automation um and it'll add routines as well to to make like the in-between cycle between the end of a job and the start of the next to make things more consistent that way so quinley is kind of the tool that has been built to run farms very consistently especially compared to human operators um i would be really curious to hear more about uh like what what that 200 printer farm is and like what the what it's making and what the requirements might be mm -hmm. yeah when he asks could you build a farm I'm like yeah i think we could <laughs> yeah um having done it before it really helps um knowing kind of what works and what doesn't um so if you're doing an automated print farm from scratch for the first time um that's different than if you do it after what we we've already done we've done two different print farms essentially yeah and already part of the design philosophy with uh quinley which is different from how 3d printing on mass works now is with with quinley we're using our experience and our knowledge running a print farm to develop quinley to run your print farm with all of that experience and and that's also why we work so closely with the community of hundreds of people because we're basically building like the collective experience of hundreds of people into quinley and gathering feedback and making sure you know all, all of these people are tuning quinley to make it work better um so that you can rely on it as opposed to an operator who might have different degrees of knowledge on how to run a printer so quinley will always give you a consistent process whereas hiring operators um, is pretty inconsistent because it's so dependent on what they know and how they do things how they do things on a particular day or any sort of you know biases they might have built in based on what tutorials they watch or just forgetting to do things yeah for, literally <laughs> forgetting to do things um whereas with quinley it's like when something doesn't work in Quinley, we have 20 people saying it should work this other way. And so we build it to work this other way. And now it's the same as like when you install it on your printer, it's as if you had those 20 people saying your printer needs to work this specific, <laughs> like this nice way. It works the way that most people think it should. <laughs> yeah. And therefore it becomes quite applicable to, to a lot of people. Yeah. It's I had a cool idea just now. What if I, what if I show them on the webcam, on the Pi cam? Just a glimpse of our print farm because we've got some printers. Oh yeah, here. yeah. Okay. You can show them through the through the UI. I know how to show them. Yeah. Okay, and this is gonna be fun. Okay. <laughs> it's 
Steven's gonna show you guys the print. Are you gonna use the Prusa webcam? I'll, I'll do the Ender because it's on a table. Do the Prusa, it's longer. Oh. Is okay, it we'll sh okay, I'll use this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll show you the the print farm that's printing beta kits right now. Uh, okay. So Steven's uh, showing you guys around. Um, this stream is very ad hoc right now. <laughs> you're you're pointing it at the ceiling. Okay, there. Yeah. I'm just gonna make it full screen as well so that you guys. How'd that feel? <laughs> Can you try one more time? I'm just gonna make it full screen. Oh sure. Was it too small? Yeah, it's pretty small. Okay. Okay. We'll try this again. <laughs> oh. Oh, it seems to it I don't think it likes doing it this way. All right. So this is our print farm right now. Uh since we moved offices, we kind of scaled it down because we were just getting so much excess capacity that we didn't need to install uh, all 50 printers again, but it, Quinley is running all of these machines. Okay, <laughs> I showed them, I showed them. Cool, nice floor. Oh, cool, yeah, it was a good floor. It's actually uh, panels from our old Q pods. We repurposed them into floors. Oh, we've got some very important comments from Kevin and Steph. They're saying to, if you're watching, please hit the like button. It, it actually does help uh, show, you know, a lot more people the video and, and help them learn about automation. YouTube really likes those likes. The likes and the subscribes, yeah. Um, one, one other thing I wanted to add, um, I think I forgot. I, f I feel like I lost my train of thought with the uh, full webcam. <laughs> Quinley, we are getting way too efficient, Steph says, which we are. Yeah, it's kind of what we were looking at it like if you go by the amount of filament sold as an industry versus the amount of printers that are out there, the max utilization is 35%. Like if you divide, oh yeah, Steph. Steph was doing the math. I think we got around on average every printer gets is it between less? five and six kilograms of filament per year, which is like that's not very much filament. Not very much because we run down when we run it with automation. We run down a kilo in one and a half days, right? Yeah. So and we could probably go faster now with new nozzles and with stuff. With the new nozzles, yeah. I want to check those out. Um. But so one and a half days times five is, you know, a week. So you're saying printers are on average printing about just over a week per year? Yeah. Well, if they're printing at max speed. Right. right. Most people print at like four grams an so hour. So we could be generous and we print at say 30. Like two months out of the year if we were very generous. Yeah, very generous. Yeah, I don't think most people's 3D printers are actually running. Yeah, the vast majority. Okay. Like more than a couple months Steph in there. Steph says it's, they came out to 15% capacity utilization. So that's mm -hmm. literally looking at the amount of filament that's been, that's been sold this year versus the amount of printers that are out there. Yeah, that's actually not too complicated math, but it yeah. does seem to check out. It does. And it, it lines up with a lot of the other numbers that we've been seeing too, like, um, when you look at how many people are out there versus how many printers, we talked about that on a previous stream as well. And yeah, the, no one is near 100% capacity utilization. And when you do get there with automated systems, you realize like you, you can get so much out of just a couple of printers. And I, we, you know, Thornhill, who was in chat earlier, right? He is pretty much on track He's on pace to do a hundred thousand parts 
in one year. Yeah. Actually, Thornhill is one of our power users, you could say. <laughs> he's using it to the extreme. A machine Creators does a ton of printing, too. He's done, you know, printing at rates of forty-five to 50,000 parts per year as well. Well, I've seen him do, like, large prints that take up most of the bed, and he's getting, like, 100 of those per week. But so those Pat, aren't short prints. Pat's saying, even with pretty constant watching, I rarely go through a roll mm. faster than every two days. Yeah, so that's, like... That's probably typical of a medium-sized print farm where you either have, you know, you, you ha you're basically maxing out the amount of printers your operator can run. Yeah. If you, Pat, I bet if you were to add any more machines, you'd either have to start batching your prints to be really, really long prints, or you would have, or you would start seeing a decrease in, in your utilization. Yeah, we've seen this a lot of times where people claim, oh yes, my printers are running 100% of the time, and they definitely aren't. <laughs> it's like 70 is kind of the maximum yeah. you can get really with operators. I think even even back when I was like no life doing 3D printing for, oh, for yeah. work, before Quinley, like seven years ago, or five, yeah, six or seven years ago, the most I could get was 60% uptime yeah which is and that was with batching prints too so i guess a, a cool thing is over the past week i've been doing a ton of prototyping and r d for um some of the beta kits coming out and i, I think i printed over 50 different g-code files in a quinley queue over a weekend and all of them worked um which is really nice because yeah because it's it's just it's consistent the material we're using is really nice um but just to say that the automation itself is consistent enough to do like a variety of parts in a row over the weekend and the spool has run out by the end of end of the weekend and all the parts are perfect uh, actually this isn't the photo of the parts right you posted that in our discord as well yeah um, you did i remember yeah i posted more pictures in there so Part of it is just getting good at slicing as well. Um, the better you get at slicing, the more efficient you can get and the, the better parts you can print um, and the more reliable you can print with automation. Oh yeah, Mateo is pil uh, pulling up the picture of some of the, the parts that I printed over the weekend. So yeah. this is all off of one printer. I just created the queue and sent hit print. Yeah, really helps. It. it... <laughs> It makes us so sad when we have to wait on other suppliers for parts because if Steven can get all of these prototypes finished in one weekend and then we have to wait three weeks for like a screw to ship to us, <laughs> it's so sad. It just messes yeah. everything up. Um, yeah, these were pretty nice parts. Show them. This is the skirt trick. It's, 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 oh, hard, to, yeah. uh, it's hard to tell people how important this stuff is, but... If you can get the skirt dialed in just right, check it out. So the skirt is just barely attached because so it's, it's... It comes off with the part. Yeah, it gets removed by the automation. But you can still get that the benefit of having a prime line. Yeah, and how easy that was. There's no tools required to remove it. Fingertip skirt removal. I'm just doing one-handed because I was filming with the other hand. So that was really yeah, easy. This is a really good demo. We should put this on our website. Yeah. So uh, if you've actually, manual. yeah, if you've read the Quinley manual, it does say to keep the skirt distance at zero point four, or zero point three nine for a zero point four nozzle. These are printed on a point eight printer, so I set that to a point eight distance, and that's just the perfect skirt. And the reason we even like spent time developing and figuring this out is, it came from having used the automation ourselves. Like when we were doing normal bed helpers, like with skirts and, and like detached skirts or attached skirts, we realized the post processing was insane. Like it, it actually adds up to so much time. Um, so we had to come up with solutions like this or solutions where no skirt is used um, mm -hmm. in order for us to get the most out of automation. Like the second you have to get a deburring tool or like a, a knife or anything, yeah. it really just. It ruins the cost of the part too. That's yeah. It's it ruins efficiency. 
<laughs> what we're all about. Your wife said it's gone a little nutty. We <laughs> moved it around. Did, um, I, did I bump the wire? It's good. No. Yeah. So Logitech will, yeah, it'll disconnect if you mess around with it. Um, let's check for more questions. It's a brim. Yeah, sorry. It's um, not a brim. It's, it's actually brim. very, well, it's very similar. Um, in this case, it was a skirt just with a distance set really small. Um, but you can actually set a, a brim with a brim distance and it'll get the same effect. Um, which can be beneficial because the skirt doesn't actually touch all the edges. Um, so it'll do kind of like a shrink wrap around your part, whereas the brim will actually touch all the internal corners. So I do use brim sometimes too, but usually skirt is what I go for. Yeah, usually there's not like the adhesion to the bed is generally good enough to go with no skirt. Yeah, it's a very close skirt. Yeah, Kevin's got it right. Yeah. So when actually on convex parts like the one I showed, it could either be a brim with a distance or a skirt with a distance and they do the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, um but if you're trying to print like an L shaped or something, then you'd have like the skirt would cut the corner, but the brim would go right up into the into the L. So um what else should we talk? about we kind of gone through everything anyone just joining us now we're showing our um our new software update which is uh available tonight or available sooner than tonight if you ask me on discord um oh i guess some behind the scenes stuff too i can't we don't have it set up on the stream but there's literally like something like a hundred tickets that were closed between the last update and this update like software either feature or bug report tickets so and some of these bug reports ended up being new features um yeah it was pretty there's a lot of new stuff so I, the difference between the software that you're using now versus this new stuff is night and day i've only really recently started using this stuff but it, it actually feels yeah, I, I correct to use the software I didn't want to put it on production until it was like solid and solid mm -hmm. and you know having 20 people help test it has been uh, has been amazing for that because everyone's got slightly different setups and slightly different use cases um oh he's saying yeah so for a four millimeter 0.4 millimeter nozzle 0.39 distance skirt basically yeah it it really depends on how squished your Z offset is. Yeah. So if it's dialed in one hundred percent perfect, then point three nine. I usually just set it to point four because it's close enough. Mm -hmm. um, some people have found point three eight. Just depends on your Z offset. So if you get zero elephant's foot, then point three nine is the way to go. But it's it's like a hundredth of a millimeter. So yeah, yeah literally. <laughs> your motor might not even be able to. You know, it might be between steps. Like your your motor resolution might not even be. In the yeah, I think most printers claim point one millimeter. Point one at the most. Point oh one. Well, the motor is point oh one, and I guess plus the extrusion width. Right. There's a lot of variables. Yeah, the steps are point. Oh one two five, I think millimeters. But then at, you know after the belt and everything, it could be. Yeah, your belt scratches and could everything. be anything. There's a lot of tolerance. It could be anything. It could be like thirty centimeters. Who knows? Um. One last kind of other, I guess, dev update we should talk about. Those of you who are in the Discord, um, have probably seen this already. But uh, we started looking at alternatives to using the Raspberry Pi because the Pi is very very hard to get and in some places actually costs like a hundred dollars yeah. for a pi 4 um which is insane I, I think it's like a big barrier to entry for a lot of people so we've got this cool uh new device here that we just started testing I had to turn off our background so this might make it easier for you guys to scale up without having to buy a bunch of pies because pies are expensive so there's two things we're doing hard for to that. get in bulk so 
This is the Rock 64, which is um, kind of like a Pi alternative. Um, it has pretty much all the same features as a Pi. We're, we're testing it performance-wise to make sure that you know, it can handle uh, as much as a Pi 4. So this one's got two gigabytes of memory. Um, and they're able to supply it at high volumes at a consistent price. So something we used to do was actually provide a pre-configured Pi kit on our website that had the SD cards flashed and configured for you. So that you would just take it out of the box, plug it in, you'd get all the correct cables, and your, your Quinly would be good to go. Um, so we're looking at this, the Rock 64, um, because they are available in bulk. And we're we're going to see if we can start offering the like pre-configured kits again, like bundles. Um, and it's a pretty cool device. I mean, if, if you're interested in like looking at um, Pies or, or even trying to use one with Quinly on, on your printer, I'd recommend checking it out. Um, so far, the results have been pretty good. Uh, so yeah, this that that's one way like this is much lower cost and it's available uh, pretty much everywhere or we would you know make it available to you um by shipping it with the quinley uh like as an add-on the other thing that we're looking at is um sort of it's come out of the work for uh doing beta on ultimaker but wrapping quinley software in a Docker image that can be deployed on any Linux device. So whether you're using one of these or whether you're using something else. Um, but a virtual machine? A VM. <laughs> you, you know, you might be able to deploy a whole bunch of Quinleys on one device. So we're looking at doing that uh, as well because, yeah, the recent chip shortage has made, um, made it, like, difficult to scale 3d printing so mm -hmm. we're always looking we're always paying attention to that kind of stuff and we're always looking at ways you know we can work around it because there's <laughs> there's not much you can do about a global chip shortage yeah a global pi 4 shortage um except come up with smart solutions to work around it yeah raspberry pi was a much nicer option a couple years ago than it is now yeah you can actually get them for 35 dollars yeah, you can. we bought them in bulk. Actually, we have a picture of when we bought a huge box of them, and it was really cool. Yeah, and we, now they don't let you buy more than one. And sometimes you can't even buy one. Yeah, sometimes they're not available. Or they're so expensive you don't want to buy it. It's actually... It's pretty interesting that they get more expensive in bulk than if you buy one. Yeah, right, they upcharge yeah. based on the quantity. Like, we were quoted for 200 we were quoted um, $108 per Pi for a Pi 4 2 gigabyte. Wow. Yeah. Which is. It's the that, opposite of that, a bulk discount. No. That, yeah, and it doesn't help with scaling. So if you can, you know, have one of these or have a computer and deploy, you know, four Quinleys or whatever on one computer, um, that'll kind of lower the barrier to scaling even more. That's actually a good point there on in chat. The guy says, if you need more chips, just get more potatoes. <laughs> those are, those are being crisp. I can assure you all of our computers and microcontrollers are not potatoes. Yeah. They are at least rocks. Some and if the, not, raspberries. Raspberries. <laughs> and some of the raspberries that we get were lemons. Which That's a good, uh, yeah. <laughs> good point. <laughs> One in 50 or something. At the time. Don't quote me on that one. It, it was at the time. We Out of the 100 we bought, two had to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was... I think we've we actually had, like, one customer with a lemon pie, too. Yeah. It's yeah. really hard to troubleshoot. Yeah. And the other thing that we can provide if if we're sending these out pre-configured, um, this is kind of a behind-the-scenes thing, but actually the, the biggest thing that our people with Quinley struggle with are all stems from Raspberry Pi configuration. Yeah. Like, I spend more time doing Raspberry Pi support than actual Quinley support, which is, like, a pretty clear indicator that either we need to pre-configure and, and um, 
you know, send stuff tested on a Pi 4 we know works, which we can't because we can't get Pi 4s, or we have to start looking at alternatives, um, which is what we're hoping to do with this Rock 64 and working with the Docker image. Kevin says the Pi 4 2 gigabyte went up in price too. I mean, $45 is still less than $108, so, but that's crazy. Like it, it's, it's not possible to get them in bulk. So, and a lot of people scaling are, are going to need availability of bulk parts. Um, part of the reason we still 3D print all the Quinley kits is because we maintain control over our own production and, you know, we can, we have that security um, in, in the knowing that, you know, we can produce things to schedule and, and produce enough of something. Whereas relying on like external components that kind of puts all your efforts out the window, which I'm sure now every single company or small business or even individual across the world has started to experience with this supply squeeze and and supply chain issues. Um, yeah, so the more that you can take it back into your own hands, like with 3D printing, for example, uh, the better because you, you get to retain control over your supply chain. Um, and obviously you're gonna be much more resilient to issues than you know, a, a part that is reliant on safely navigating 3,000 kilometers of ocean before it gets to you. Yeah, we've been struggling. A lot yeah. of people have been struggling because all these container ships don't know where to go. <laughs> they get stuck in storms and yeah, stuff. Or just cause massive backlogs. I got a question here. Could you run a Quinley farm off of a Pi cluster? So I think that may be possible when we make the Docker images. Although I don't know... I have never built a Pi cluster myself. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if we dockerized it and Pi cluster is just like a server that uses a lot of Pi's shared resources. So I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. Um, we're still looking at like when we do package it as a Docker image, how many instances of Quinley can we actually run on a single Pi? That that remains to be seen. Um, it is also dependent on some, like, network software architecture stuff. So, like, if we move the really heavy, computationally heavy components off onto a server somewhere, you'd be able to control much more printers, many more printers from your Pi than if that those functions were on the pi as well yeah i know even like people trying to run two instances of octo print it's not trivial to set up and no. doesn't even work because you get you'll get stuttering on one or the other printer some people say they've done 20 but i have no idea because even on a single usb port you can get stuttering if the g code is consumed too fast so i, I don't yeah. know how um someone would run 20 printers unless they were all printing really slow parts. Have two mm. printers been tested on one Pi? Not yet. We still, so we're still working on actually packaging the Quinley as the Docker image first, and then we're going to actually test it with the Rock 64. We, I think we're, Pi's are too expensive for too many people at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but, We'll we'll test on the Rock sixty four first, and then also test on the Pi because our entire user base is is on Pi fours right now. Um, but yeah, that's that's the intention. We're gonna test um, how many printers we can run on a single Pi. I think based on so this update that's coming out is really lightweight. Um, we optimize a lot of things, and I think. For, like, I, I'm pretty sure we'd be able to run four printers on a single Pi um, and potentially even get that number higher. 
the biggest barrier right now is if we had to run four camera streams on a single Pi, because the, you know, the, it's kind of hard on the Pi's to, to run high quality camera streams. Yeah, it might just be like if you want multiple printers on a Pi, then just don't have a camera. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're still looking at it, and um, yeah, if anyone has any uh, advice on on like deploying that kind of thing, even with Octoprint, I'd I'd love to to pick your brains on it because it is it is an interesting problem. I think we could probably get three, yeah, four four on one pi, just assign one to each core, mm -hmm. and then see how much is left over. Um, I wonder if you could get around it with like. A nice combination of like arc welder slicing resolution yeah maybe some there might have to be some like scheduling stuff going on on the processor but just being able to not overload the pie with having nice slow g code <laughs> yeah that would be a really weird compromise to make people do though it would be interesting though because you know every yeah. every time you want to squeeze more efficiency out of your stuff you usually have to make it a little bit more complicated that's the yeah the no no free lunch theorem <laughs> <laughs> no free lunch. well you get quite a bit of lunch with quinley uh, uh, we have to admit yeah that. i mean it's like you're, you're getting the whole lunch and this is adding the cherry on top kind of um the raspberry actually the raz or the rock the rock <laughs> you need uh, really good teeth to, to eat that lunch yeah um so i think that's maybe just to wrap up this section so we're, we're looking we've got the rock 64 and we are going to look at um providing pre-configured kits again so that you don't have to worry about sourcing a pi locally and you'll just get a full kit with everything included um and you won't have to worry about supply chain issues as well so if you're interested in, in keeping up to date with the testing on this, um, I definitely recommend joining our Discord. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are trying to, do, will, are kind of lined up to try to point Quinley on different systems as well. So, <laughs> yeah, this is uh... Jack and Kevin are feuding. <laughs> I always use Arc Welder, I never use Arc Welder. Jack and Kevin. It's like a unstoppable force meets an immovable object. Yeah. These guys are, these guys are made for each other. Thank you, Bob, for, uh, for for complimenting the hard work of our software dev team. It's been a very long time in the making, and hopefully, it makes your experience uh, with Quinley much smoother and and just makes three D printing easier and more enjoyable as well. Yeah. This is what we want to do, make it as easy as possible to get into automation because it's a really complicated, scary thing if you've never done it before. So trying to do everything we possibly can to make it just plug and play. You know, if that means it's a lot of stuff that you don't see going on behind the scenes, yeah. There there's a lot of work done just to make sure that when you plug it in, it recognizes your printer, it configures everything for that printer. You don't have to do any coding, you don't have to set up anything just I'd, connect to the internet that's it i'll go back to the ui like just to just to give you guys an idea of like every single one of these features um at minimum you know three com community members were consulted to make sure that it would work correctly um the whole ui design i think it bears repeating was actually conceived by doing six hours of interviews with uh, different community members, um, like just sitting down on the phone saying, what, like, how do you want Quinley to work? What, what do you use your printers for? What is your current workflow? You know, what makes you frustrated about the current workflow? And then eventually, our graphic designer Catalina put together this, went through a couple of rounds of tweaking with those same people, and then we, you know, published a beta. We had twenty people sign on, download it, 
um, <laughs> find bugs, report the bugs, tell us what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, and yeah, I mean, that ultimately resulted in this. And, you know, this is still the first of many updates. If, if you guys have been hanging around, uh, you know, since September, you know, we we've spoken about adding smart features into this. This is like the base platform now, but even um, adding things like uh, machine vision to detect failures, to make sure, you know, to catch failures before they damage your printer, to catch failures before you waste too much material and before it becomes like really difficult to clean up. Yeah, we forgot about that. That's like a huge thing coming up. Machine learning, machine vision. It's massive. Yeah. yeah, that's potentially one of the coolest things that's going to happen with Quinley. And it'll be free, too. Yeah. Which, yeah, I think it'll be free. Free spaghetti detectors? That sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, it's more than spaghetti. It's 14, there, yeah, it's actually 14 different flavors of pasta are detected. Oh. Yeah. Under extrusion. Uh, I don't think over extrusion is detected fully yet, but stringing, uh, parts detaching early warping um obviously spaghetti uh i can't name them all i know there were 14 different failure modes that were detected. like warping stuff not coming out of the nozzle stringing part doesn't exist on the bill plate anymore <laughs> yeah that that one's important that that one serves two purposes because then we can ensure that also it reset correctly mm -hmm. and that was actually a question that the ultimaker guys had for us is like because they're they design their printer in, in the same way we design Quinley software, which is it, it has to be very robust to mistakes and it has mm -hmm. to be very user friendly. Um so one of the questions they had for us on the call was like, oh, how do you make sure that the part is actually successfully removed? So we, we yeah. have models for for detecting that kind of thing as well that are gonna be implemented. Um but it, it's really like all the stuff that you do, whether it's consciously or not, when you run your 3D printers. And by saving you bits of time here and there, multiplied across all the parts you can make, you're, you're saving days and weeks of time. And um, that's like truly the potential of automated printing. You're saving days of your own time for each printer, which means you can either run more printers or run your printers more and run your printers more effectively but it also means you can spend your time doing better things that are more important because you know spending third even if it's only 30 seconds to make sure that your part is not on the build plate anymore is still time spent and yeah. like time that is breaking your focus on doing more high value things like designing parts to be printed and not to mention the overhead, like the overhead of just having a print to worry about constantly on your mind is something worth considering now with Quinley. You can be like, oh, the automation has it. So actually a couple of nice things from, from Christopher here. He said losing the time between prints um, while at work is what he hates the most. And yeah, that's another thing that, that Quinley solves. It fills in all the time that your printer is idle. If you have a lot to print, then it'll fill in all the gaps with whatever's in your queue. I mean, the fact that you were able to print 50 parts while you were on your weekend is like, yeah, not not something a lot of people can do. I left on Friday with a big queue, and I came on Monday and realized that everything had printed and the filament ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a full spool of filament too. So, um, yeah. And actually another quick one on for Chris, for the CR10, we, we actually just recently got one in our office. Um, so maybe okay. a little sneak peek of what's coming soon. We might be showing off a little bit about oh, we'll that. We'll have photos today, right? Yeah, we're taking photos of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah, because we, we need uh, product photos and, you know, we can actually uh, test fit our parts in-house now. So it's quite nice. We'll, we'll, we'll show some more updates on the CR10 and... Uh, Actually, the CR6 and the Sidewinder 2, a um, little bit further down in the future, but just a little bit of a sneak peek. Bob is saying he's updating the pie in the morning, and he's got to find some more things to print and sell. That is a really good, uh, yeah. good plan. And 
you know, with all the stuff that you can now print, you can easily, you know, pay off, pay, pay for, the Quinley will pay for itself and it'll pay for another printer and another Quinley down the road. Um, yeah. So what seems to happen is that when you get a Quinley, your supply is taken care of and you actually have to spend more time creating demand. Yeah. So you can work on marketing instead of having to work on your printer. Uh, C Ray says delamination. I think that was one of them. Uh, there's. It's like layer splitting. Leah, Leah, if you if you, Leah, who was um, working on the development for that model, she wrote a bunch of really brilliant articles on LinkedIn. So if you if you search up Leah Hartwell on LinkedIn, uh, you'll see her articles, and she goes into. Uh, how the model works and, and what type of things it detects and it was there's a whole bunch of images too if you're inclined to uh, look at images you, you also did a live stream on oh, that's her great. whole machine version um uh project so What's I'll, that one called? i'm gonna see if i can find it um i think it's called like, oh yeah here we go oh no it's not that one <laughs> it's later uh, it would have been at the end of august we ruined hundreds of prints for science. Yeah, hundreds of prints for science. I'm going to see if I can post a link in the chat. Sure. Be able to. So, we're, uh, we're coming to the end of this stream, but if you're interested to look at more, I'm just going to paste in a link here. Come on. Jeez, it lets me do it. Yeah. Leah's working at BlackBerry right now, which is super cool. Yeah. But we'll bring her back one day. Yeah. Well, she's working at BlackBerry. Maybe she could work at Raspberry Pi. Maybe she could work at Rock sixty four. All the all the fruits. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thanks for posting that. Oh yeah, you should show the part that we actually yeah. came off of our queue. I'll put it against Mateo's white shirt. So oh, you can thank see you. it. Thank you. This is what was printed. Actually, it's gonna clear the bed soon. On. Uh, it's resetting on. on oh, on the screen. On our UI, yeah. You want to show it? Yeah, I'll show it. This is a handle Ultimaker. for the Ultimaker door. Yeah, it's a pretty small print. They always gloss over the three and the hydration. <laughs> Actually, when we ignore it, you guys post more in the chat. Yeah, it boosts engagement by ignoring. Read Quinley. Jack, if you can find 50 people to order to beta the three Quinley, we'll, we'll do it. And this is a serious offer. You need to find the the hidden three communities out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hydration. That's another important one. I didn't think BlackBerry was still in business. They're doing a whole bunch of EV stuff. I don't know what Leah's working on, but I know BlackBerry is trying to get into EV. Well, there's a little bit of machine learning that goes on in there. I yeah. Say. Yeah. What is this? Yeah. Traffic light or fire hydrant? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Jack says he's going to order the 50. Jack, can you do that? Is that allowed? Can you have a 50 print farm? Technically. EZ3? Well, there's no chance. If you want it, if you want to order 50 It'll then. cost us more to develop and support it than the 3 itself, probably. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll save on shipping because we'll we're just see. shipping to Jack. 50 so. people equals beta. First come, first serve. Okay. Yeah. Jack, if you do that, we'll 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 support it. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. If this happens, we'll bring Jack on stream too. Yeah. To talk about why he wants fifty easy three kits. It'd be like the most outrageous meme <laughs> that's <laughs> happened in the history of three D Q. All right. So I think that's it for today. Um thanks everyone for joining. Thanks. I hope you guys uh all enjoy the new UI um, and all of the new functionality. Make sure to join our Discord. You know we've we've done our best to. Uh, how do I get in on the Ender Three Max beta? Send us an email. Uh, on our website. Yeah, we're we're actually actively looking for the next betas to, to do. Yeah. So, um, if you let us know. Yeah, if you want to get. The Ender 3 Max into beta. Let us know by email. Get your friends in. Get your fellow Ender 3 Max owners uh, signed up as well to you know indicate that there's interest and 
uh, we'll start working on it. Um, now there's no key to bet on some of the easy things. That's yeah, that's job. great. So the automation won't work. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack, if you do that, it's probably just going to be a really uh fun time upgrading all of them to have a heated bed. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Ah, 350 by 350 beds. Actually, yeah, we, I, 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 that's like the Soval printer, I think. There's, um, I started looking into 500 by 610 beds. Oh. Yeah, for some large format machines. It's actually, it's, it's possible to produce them, like, consistently. The issue is going to be how to ship them safely. Right. Because they're going to be these giant that's pieces be of like material. This. Yeah. They're yeah. enormous. Beta button on the site isn't working. Uh, I'll show you once again real quick. Oh, yeah. Those buttons are placeholders. I think he's talking about the ones on the main store or the main website. Yeah. Okay. If you go to the shop. Click on this one, beta testing. That's the one. And then you'll get an email back. Or you can email us at uh, info at 3dq.com. I think it's at the bottom. Um, where's my one? Oh, I said Jack said one millimeter by one millimeter. Bed. One millimeter. I really want to see a print release from a, a one meter by one meter print bed. Ender extended. Okay, it's time to sign off. Make sure to join the community Discord. Thanks for posting that. And um, yeah, we can keep the conversation going in there, or we'll see you next Wednesday. Um, yeah, try going on our shop webpage or just emailing us directly. Uh, King Sidorak. Okay, Jack is reaching out to the three members. We'll see yeah. how that plays out next week <laughs> on the stream. Yep. Same time, Wednesday, 4.30 PST. Uh, we'll see you there. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.